my name is Jorge Yilad with the Fulton Sheen Prayer Group Apostolate. What you are about to experience is a journey in truth, and we want to share this truth with you. The Venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen, known for his preaching and especially his work in radio and television. In the 1950s, his Emmy Award-winning television show called Life is Worth Living made him a household name. During his time in ministry, Sheen authored 67 books and recorded over 300 lessons. We believe that you will truly be blessed and enjoy these recordings of his 50 lesson series titled Life is Worth Living. God love you. Last week in lesson 13, Christ in the Creed, Birth, the lengthening shadow of the crossbars, Sheen discussed that the cross was not an afterthought and that Christ had to be lifted up on the cross for man to be saved. Today in Lesson 14, Suffering, Death, Resurrection, by His Wounds We Are Healed, she will be discussing, did Christ become a sin bearer through a sinless obedience? Are the wounds of our risen Lord important to our salvation? You're going to love today's program and discover that life is worth living. God love you. And welcome back to the Fulton Sheen Prayer Group Apostolate Show. And as we should begin all of our prayer groups, we will do so by having Father Will Combs of the Brothers of the Beloved Disciple lead us in the invocation of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Father Will, would you please? Great. Well, I invite you all to take a deep breath of the Holy Spirit as we call upon the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as you are breathed forth by Jesus, crucified, risen, and glorified in the upper room, we pray that indeed, Holy Spirit, you breathe upon us to fully listen and learn the good news, the good news of the cross, this great mystery of God's love even to the extreme, that we be filled with love and in return, take up our cross and follow our Savior to the kingdom. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Will, again, of the Archdiocese of San Antonio. And also, as we should begin each lesson, we will pray the Litany of Humility, led by Father Clay Hunt of the Archdiocese of San Antonio and chaplain for the criminal justice ministry here within the Archdiocese. Uh, Father Clay, would you please? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, meek and humble of heart. Hear me. Hear me. From the desire of being esteemed. Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being loved. Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled. Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored. Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised. Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others. Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted. Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being despised. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being calumniated. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being suspected. Deliver me, Jesus that others may be loved more than I. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be esteemed more than I. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That in the opinion of the world others may increase and I may decrease. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be chosen and I set aside. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be praised and I unnoticed. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be preferred to me in everything. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may become holier than I, provided that I become as holy as I should. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Clay. And now... Lesson 14. Peace be to you. In this lesson we continue the creed, which links together the birth of our Lord, his cross, and his resurrection. We consider in this lesson particularly his sufferings and resurrection. And we begin with the agony of our Lord. Here we are dealing with a great mystery. Our blessed Lord suffered mentally 
and physically. We touch upon first his mental sufferings in the Garden of Gethsemane. The time was immediately after the Last Supper. There is only one recorded time in the life of our blessed Lord when he sang. And that was after the Last Supper when he went out to his death. He then told his apostles that they would all be shaken during this hour. Remember that our Lord always spoke of his crucifixion and his sufferings in terms of hour, his glory in terms of day. Evil has its hour. God has his day. As he entered that garden into which he had often gone to pray, he told his apostles that they would be scandalized in him that night because the shepherd would be struck. And they were scandalized indeed. For a short time after the agony, they fled. But he told them, however, when he went in, I will go before you into Galilee when I have risen from the dead. Such a promise was never made before, that a dead man would keep an appointment with his friends after three days in the tomb. Though the sheep would forsake the shepherd, the shepherd would not forsake the sheep. As Adam lost the heritage of union with God in the garden, so now our blessed Lord ushers in our restoration in a garden. Eden and Gethsemane are two gardens around which revolve the fate of humanity. In Eden, Adam sinned. In Gethsemane, Christ took humanity's sin upon himself. In Eden, Adam hid from God. In Gethsemane, Christ interceded with his father. In Eden, God sought out Adam in his sin of rebellion. In Gethsemane, the new Adam Christ sought out the father in submission and resignation. In Eden, a sword was drawn to prevent entrance into the Garden of Eden and thus immortalize evil. In Gethsemane, our Lord told Peter to sheathe the sword that he had carried. Now, there are two elements that are bound up together in this agony. Sin-bearing and sinless obedience. He goes afar from his apostles, about as far, the scriptures say, as a man could throw a stone. What a curious way to measure distance. And our Lord threw himself upon his face, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass me by. Only as thy will is, not as mine is. Notice how the two natures of our Lord are involved here. He and the Father were one, so he did not pray our Father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass. But my Father, unbroken was the consciousness of his Father's love. But on the other hand, remember that he's man as well as God. His human nature recoiled from death as a penalty for sin. It was very natural for a human nature to shrink from the punishment which sin deserves. So the prayer to have the cup of passion pass was human. In other words, the no was human. The yes 
to the divine will was the overcoming of that human reluctance to suffering for the sake of redemption. Our blessed Lord now takes upon himself the sins of the world as if he himself were guilty. This is very difficult for us to understand because we always think of physical suffering as a greater evil than moral. Furthermore, we become so used to sin, we do not realize its horror. The innocent understands sin much better than the sinful. The one thing from which man never learns anything by experience is sinning. A sinner becomes infected with sin. It becomes so much a part of him that he may even think himself virtuous, as the feverish think themselves well at times. It is only the virtuous who stand outside of the current of sin, who can look upon evil as a doctor looks upon disease, and who understand the full horror of evil. It is also impossible for us to realize how God felt the opposition of human wills to the divine will. I wonder what example we could find to illustrate that. Perhaps the closest is when a parent feels the strangeness of the power of an obstinate will of one of his children. That child can resist and spurn persuasion, love, hope, and fear of punishment. What a strong power abides in a body so slight and a mind so childish. This is a faint picture of men when they have sinned willfully. What is sin for the soul but a separate principle of wisdom, working out its own ends as if there were no God. Antichrist is nothing but the full, unhindered growth of self-will. That's what our Lord had to face in the garden. The opposition of all human wills to the divine will. So in obedience now to the Father's will, our Lord takes upon himself the iniquities of all the world to become a sin bearer. There never was a sin committed in the world for which he did not suffer. The sin of Adam was there when as the head of the humanity he lost for all men the heritage of God's grace. Cain was there purple in the sheet of his brother's blood The abominations of Sodom and Gomorrah were there. The forgetfulness of his chosen people who fell down before false gods were there. The coarseness of pagans who had revolted against the natural law. These pagans were there too. All sins were there. Sins committed in the country that made all nature blush. Sins of the young for whom the tender heart of Christ was pierced. Sins of the old who should have passed the age of sinning. Sins committed in the darkness where it was thought the eyes of God could not pierce. Sins committed in the light that made even the wicked shudder. Blasphemy seemed to be on his lips as if he had spoken them. And from the north and the south, the east and the west, the foul miasma of the world's sin rushes upon him like a flood. Samson-like, he reaches up and pulls down the whole guilt of the world upon himself as if he were guilty, paying for the debt in our name so that we might once more have access to the Father. He was, so to speak, mentally preparing himself for the great sacrifice, 
laying upon his sinless soul the sins of a guilty world. I say every sin was there. Your sin was there. And so was mine. And is it any wonder then that they began to pour from his body drops of blood that fell upon the ground like beads forming a rosary of redemption. Sin is in the blood, and for the remission of sin, blood had to be poured forth. He was guiltless. But he prayed and suffered in our name. Then came Judas. Our Lord had to understand even false brethren. Judas threw his arms around the neck of our blessed Lord and blistered his lips with a kiss. Our Lord is now made a buffoon during the night, as he has also tried before two religious judges, Annas and Caiaphas. In all, our blessed Lord was tried before four judges. Two of them were religious judges. They belonged to the Jews. Two were civil judges. Pilate and Herod. Pilate was a Roman, a Gentile, and Herod was an Edomite. The judges could not agree on why he should be condemned. Different charges were made in different courts. In the religious court, our blessed Lord was condemned of blasphemy. In the civil court, our blessed Lord is condemned of treason. Before the religious judges, he is found to be too religious, too divine, too unworldly. Before the civil judges, he's found to be too political, too human, too worldly. They cannot agree on why he should be condemned. They can only agree that he should be. And simply because he is to be condemned on contradictory charges... One because he's too divine and the other because he's too human. Where would there be a fitting punishment except the sign of contradiction, which is the cross? Let us take a brief scene from each of these trials. The trial before the religious judges. Caiaphas was unable to find any reason why he could condemn our Lord. He introduced false witnesses, but the witnesses could not agree among themselves. Caiaphas finally resorted to an oath. He put our blessed Lord under it, and with all of the sternness that he could muster, and annoyed by all the contradictions of the witnesses that he had heard, he said to our blessed Lord, I adjure thee by the living God to tell us whether thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Now, when Caiaphas asked that question, if he was the Christ, the Son of God, remember that his mind was not like ours. When you and I hear the word Christ, we go back to his earthly life, not Caiaphas. Caiaphas was going back to all of the prophecies. He was going back to the book of Genesis. He knew how the Messiah had been foretold. And so the question was, was he the Messiah? Was he the Son of God? 
Was he clad with divine power? Was he the word made flesh? Was it true that God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spoke to us through the prophets, in these last days was speaking through him the Son? And so he asked, Art thou the Son of God? And our Lord answered, I am. With sublime consciousness and majestic dignity, he announced that he was the Messiah and the Son of the living God. And when he said, I am, I'm sure that Caiaphas remembered that when God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, those were the words that God used of himself. I am. Our Lord now speaks to Caiaphas again and says, Moreover, I tell you this, you will see the Son of Man again when he is seated at the right hand of God's power and comes on the clouds of heaven. Notice our blessed Lord affirmed his divinity, then his humanity, and both under the personal pronoun I. He is telling Caiaphas that someday he will be judged. Caiaphas now finds, finds our blessed Lord guilty. He rends his garments as a token of the fact that he had heard blasphemy because Christ was making himself God. But Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, and the people could not put our blessed Lord to death. That power belonged to the Romans. And so they hustle our blessed Lord as the prisoner off to Pilate. He has several trials before Pilate, and Pilate sends him off to Herod. But it is interesting to note the charge that is brought before Pilate against our blessed Lord. In the trial of any ordinary human being, there is a continuity of charges. Our blessed Lord was found guilty of blasphemy. Now, when the prisoner is brought to a higher court, you would think that he would still be condemned to blasphemy. But he's not. Why not? Well, because if Caiaphas and his friends told Pilate that our blessed Lord had made himself God, Pilate would laugh at them. Pilate was a pagan. He would say, I have my gods. You are yours. I sprinkle incense before mine every morning. They therefore had to find some other charge. Now the charge that they would bring against our blessed Lord would be treason. He would be too political. He would be too human. He would be too early. It must be remembered too that Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin hated the Romans. The Romans had conquered their country. Roman judges were seated in judgment. Roman coinage was in their pockets. Caesar's ensigns were all over the city of Jerusalem and all through the land that was holy. They hated the invader. They hated Rome. Now when they bring our blessed Lord before Pilate and he asks what charges do they bring against the man, they said that they had found him guilty of perverting the nation, refusing to give tribute to Caesar. Imagine. Refusing to give tribute to Caesar. Caesar, whom they hated. Pilate knew that they did not love Caesar, but in order to win their release, after many incidents in the trial, they finally said to him, Thou art no friend of Caesar if thou dost release him. The man who pretends to be a king is Caesar's rival. Pilate was afraid of being reported to Rome. What would Tiberius do to him? Would he unseat him? But Pilate tried to save our Lord. He had called our Lord innocent seven times. Now he scourges our blessed Lord, brings him out before the people and says, Behold your king!
And up against that marble balustrade came a wave of voices saying, We have no king but Caesar. Then Pilate gave up Jesus into their hands to be crucified. Our Lord is now led to Calvary. Once on those heights, he offers his hands to his executioners, the hands from which the world's graces flow. The first dull knock of the hammer is heard in silence. Mary and John hold their ears. The sound is unendurable. The echo sounded as another stroke. And then the cross is lifted slowly off the ground. Then with a thud that seemed to shake even hell itself, it sank into the pit prepared for it. Our Lord has mounted his pulpit for the last time. He spoke seven words. That is to say seven times. We cannot give you the seven words for want of time. But the first word of our blessed Lord was for all who had crucified and all who had brought him to death. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It is not wisdom that saves. It is ignorance. And then after hanging three hours on the cross, our blessed Lord now prepares to surrender his life. Remember that he had often said, No man takes my life away from me. I lay it down of myself. It is to be noted, therefore, that when our blessed Lord came to the seventh word, the scriptures say that he spoke those words in a loud voice to show that he was the master of his own life. And just as planets only after a long period of time complete their orbits and then come back to their starting point as if to salute him who sent them on their way, so now he was the prodigal son who left the father's house, wasted his life and his blood for our sakes, is preparing to go back home, and he lets fall from his lips the perfect prayer. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. There is a rupture of a heart through a rapture of love, he bows his head and dies. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea come to take him down from the cross. They embalm him in a hundred pounds of spices. And it is interesting what scripture says. In the same quarter where he was crucified, there was a garden. The word garden hinted at Eden and the fall of man, as it also suggested through its flowers in the springtime the resurrection from the dead. In that garden was a tomb in which, in the language of Scripture, no man had ever been buried. Born of a virgin womb, He is buried in a virgin tomb. And as Crashaw said, and a Joseph did betroth them both. Nothing seems more repellent than to have a crucifixion in a garden. And yet there would be compensation, for the garden would have his resurrection. He was born in a stranger's cave, and so he is buried in a stranger's grave, because human birth and human death are equally foreign to him. Dying for others, he's placed in another's grave. His grave was borrowed, borrowed for he would give it back on Easter as he gave back the beast 
which he rode on Palm Sunday, when he said, The Lord hath need of it. When he rose from the dead, he made many appearances, as we have already said. In one of the appearances of the resurrection, for which we did not give many details, was a week after all of the other apostles had seen our blessed Lord. They had been become convinced, but only after much evidence and after much doubting. And our blessed Lord comes into the upper room and says, Peace be to you. Now Thomas had refused to believe. Thomas, one of the apostles. He said, I will not believe until I have seen the mark of nails on his hands. Until I have put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hands into his side. You will never make me believe. Now our blessed Lord appears. He speaks to Thomas. Let me have thy finger. See? Here are my hands. Let me have thy hand. Put it into my side. Cease thy doubting and believe. And throwing himself on his knees, he said to the risen Savior, Thou art my Lord and my God. Oh, there are some who will never believe even when they see. Thomas thought that he was doing the right thing and demanding the full evidence of sensible proof. But what would become of future generations if the same evidence was to be demanded by them. Suppose you would not believe the resurrection until you could put finger into his hand and hand it to his side. The future believers, our Lord implied, must accept the fact of the resurrection from those who have been with him. Our Lord thus pictured the faith of believers after the apostolic age, when there would be none who would have seen it but their faith would have a foundation because the apostles themselves had seen the risen Christ. How do we know there was a resurrection? Simply because the church was there. The church was there and the apostles. They saw the resurrection. Thomas was there. The daughter. Thomas believed. And he believed in the name of all who could not see sensibly who could accept the testimony of those whom Christ sent out to preach the gospel of the resurrection to all nations. But the story is not over. In the next lesson, we will touch on his ascension to the right hand of the Father. The story is not over. Wow. Again, if you're just tuning in to us, you're watching uh, Life is Worth Living with Venerable Fulton J. Sheen. And we're about to hear some amazing words coming from Father Will Combs. Father Will, please well, share God. with us. A great joy. Isn't that beautiful? That again, in the creed, we see the seed. The seed, uh, and from the seed comes the tree, the tree of life. Let's take a look at this great profound comparison he makes between these two gardens of, of, of Eden, which means delight, and Gethsemane, which means the olive oil press. And truly, Jesus was so pressed, out came the olive oil, beautiful sign of the Holy Spirit. It's through the cross, the tree of life, comes the Holy Spirit. He was a stone throw away, means that he's set apart. He is the holy of holies. He is set apart. And yet we also see in the, in the Garden of Eden, it's not good for man to be alone. And so Jesus is saying, stay with me and pray with me as they fall asleep. While in Eden, we have Eve and Adam reaching up to the tree in great pride and exaltation to be like God, to be their own God. 
we see uh, instead that Jesus throws himself down to the ground in great humility. And, of course, that's where the thorns and thistles will be from the curse of, of the original sin. And, of course, Jesus the next day will be having a crown of thorns. We see that Eve is talking to a fallen angel while a, a blessed angel comes to comfort Jesus in his prayers. We see that the curse of original sin is the sweat of your face. And it's from Jesus' face he sweats blood. And it's the blood that purifies And blessed are the pure, for they shall see. And he says, beautiful quote, that the innocent understand sin much better than the sinful because they can see. And it's by his blood we have the power to become pure again, to become a new creation, a new Adam. And that's what Adam means. A new humanity is Jesus. So let's go deeper into this garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. We see that it's while Adam and Eve say, my will be done. And again, he's taking this to a whole new level, Archbishop Fulton Sheehan. That's the Antichrist when we say, my will be done. As they, everyone in hell says the same thing, I did it my way. <laughs> you know? And we're called to do it God's way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and life. Not, not self-will, but divine will. And that's this beautiful prayer. So he defeats the original sin. He defeats the sin of Garden of Eden with the Garden of Gethsemane prayer, Father, thy will be done. And not once, not twice, but three times. Because three times Eve was tempted, for it was good for food, delight to the eyes, and desirable to make one wise. And so three times Jesus is saying, not my will, thy will be done. He says, the soul is in great torment unto death. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. And we are body, soul, and spirit. And these three must be in agreement according to God's will. But when we're not, when our beliefs and our behavior don't match, we don't have peace. It's called cognitive disorder. It's the brain, belief, and behavior. Are we going to do what we should? Are we going to do what we want? And so there's a huge battle, as we see in Scripture, between the spirit and the flesh. This is big, huge battle is going on in our own lives. And we have to just choose. Are we going to be choosing the Garden of Eden, which means delight, all about me, my will, or the Garden of Gethsemane to be pressed like Jesus and now pours the Holy Spirit when we pray and live, thy will be done. And so there's this battle in some senses between belief and behaviors, like between the divine and the human. So Archbishop Fulton Sheen speaks a lot about the divine and the human. And he's able to integrate the two into one by making the human completely submissive and obedient uh, to, to the divine, to the will of God. And so, my will be done. We see that the, all the apostles fall asleep. Today, many are choosing to fall asleep. They're choosing painkillers. They're choosing euthanasia. They're choosing suicide. They're choosing all kinds of forms of, of drug abuse because we're afraid of pain. We're afraid of suffering. And it's, again, it's Jesus who comes down saying to us, do not be afraid to suffer with me. It's in this suffering with Jesus we find perfect love, perfect joy, and perfect freedom to be detached from all that keeps us bound. We see in the presentation of Jesus this foreshadowing of his own offering, two offerings, the two turtle doves, which according to Leviticus chapter 12 is the sin offering and the burnt offering. And that's what we are called, just like Jesus, to be sin bearers, to intercede, a sin offering. We offer ourselves for the sins of humanity. Father, forgive them. And also, a burnt offering means a holocaust, a complete offering with Jesus. Thy will be done, spirit, soul, and body. And, uh, and by this complete surrender, we come then to the great garden. Uh, from, of course, the tree of life is the cross. And then this new garden is the garden of the resurrection, when God makes all things new. So, um, hallelujah, let's go this great journey from one garden to the resurrection. That was awesome. Not my will, but thine be done. Thank you so much, Father Will. Uh, It was awesome. I'm going to have to replay this and listen to that over and over. (laughs) Uh, Phil, uh, please share with us what struck you. Well, I'm also taken to the garden, and I think Bishop Sheen does such an incredible, magical job of putting us there. Mm -hmm. He puts us there, uh, and we can see it. We can see it. He says, the no was human, the yes was divine, and he's showing us, as Father Will said, the two natures of Jesus. Uh, the, we, we feel that too. 
our no's are human. We say no to God, and that's our human selves, right? We need to say yes, and that's the divine reaching out to us. He says yes to divine will, overcoming that human reluctance to suffering for the sake of redemption. He overcomes it for the sake of redemption. He also does it for love because he loves us so much. And uh, we don't like suffering. Us humans, we don't like suffering, right? We want to we wanna escape suffering. Uh, Father Will talks about pain. We want to get rid of the, kill the pain. Uh, but suffering can be so good for us, right? It's, it, we can use it for such good things, for divine things. Uh, I do love this line that he says, the one thing from which man never learns anything by experience is sinning. Yeah. Ain't that the truth? We don't become better sinners, right? Uh, he, he says something very important, he, and it's an essential truth of our faith, but he says, paying for the debt in our name so that we might have access to the Father. And it's a fundamental truth, but I think it's a truth that e- even us Catholics don't, don't really grab onto. They don't understand. It, it's just a, 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 an article of faith to them. They don't understand that he had to do this in order that we could get back, get back to see the Father, get back to heaven. Uh, and... You know, I, I love our ecumenical uh, uh, teaching that says that everyone, you know, there's other paths. We, we say by God's mercy, mercy, there's other paths. But this is the path that people need to know about. He died for us to give us access to the Father. Love that. Love that. Thank you, Phil. Greg, Greg Weston, how about you? Share with us, please. I'm going to spend a minute and, and just stay with the human will versus the divine will. And, and just realize that um, Jesus was human, and he was, uh, though divine, he had the, his humanity to in, encounter. And I was just so struck in this, in this case where it said, it said um, uh, notice how the two natures of our Lord are involved here. He and his Father were one so that he did not pray our Father. He said, my Father, unbroken with the conscious, consciousness of his Father's love. On the other hand, remember he is the man as well as God. Human nature recoiled from death as a penalty of sin. So the prayer to have the cup of passion pass was human. In other words, no was human. Lord, is there really no other way to do this? But I think from last week I even remember um, how it was a function of he came to die. He didn't come to live. He came to die. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, so your points were right in line with, with theirs. Wait, great way to follow them. And he did come to die so that we could all live. Thank you for that uh, so much, Greg. God bless you. You know, I, what amazed me on this one was I've never heard Archbishop Sheen so passionate. His voice was so different than this one. And he actually, I was paying attention more. And I, Again, I'm not kidding. I'm going to hear this one over and over. It did strike me. Um, I love the contrast between the gardens. I'd never never paid as much attention to that until this time, the way Sheen shared that. As Adam lost the heritage of union with God in the garden, so now our blessed Lord ushers in our restoration in a garden. In Eden, Adam sinned. In Gethsemane, Christ took humanity's sin upon himself. Just though hearing Sheen share that uh, struck me as well because... Jesus was, was sinless and yet became sin or took on the, the weight of all of our sins. Amazing. Thank you. Um, Father Clay Hunt, uh, I tell you, I, I love hearing you. Please share with us. Praise be to God. I got so excited today. <laughs> <laughs> I love Archbishop Fulton Sheen. What a, what a magnificent blessing in the truth, which is singular, that he's able to communicate to us. We thank God for, for such a champion that the Lord has given to the church. And just like unto Christ, you're going to see that there will be those who try to accuse him, to, uh, to slander his name, to bring charges against him. But uh, obviously, it's like the Lord himself said, by their fruits, you will know them. And truth rings from this man's teaching like like the liberty bells 
that that ring to freedom. And so we praise God. Uh, we love Archbishop Fulton Sheen. I love, uh, you know, I like movies. Father Clay likes movies a lot. And I, I love Star Wars. The reason I, I love Star Wars is because it's a priest of the Lord. I'm a full-grown Jedi Knight. But uh, we recognize that actually Archbishop Fulton Sheen is a Jedi Master. Man, that guy is something else. And it's magnificent to to be able to make these connections and to understand that, uh, in fact, it is only through the cross that we come to glory. We anticipate to glory as Christians. We follow Christ. And sometimes, you know, I know people s struggle a lot with the understanding of suffering and question why. Why is it this? Why is it that? But it's absolutely necessary uh, that in order to be with the Master, we have to follow after the Master. And suffering, although disagreeable, is very magnificently purifying. And it brings us to, uh, to uh, healing. It brings us to, uh, to atonement. It brings us to newness of life. And, and that's why it's important that we're able to intellectually uh, rise up to that. A lot of times I see people uh, struggling with suffering. And I remember when I studied in Rome, I was there with another champion that was uh, Pope John Paul II. And I remember seeing him deteriorate in those last years of his life to the last time I saw him there. In the hospital window, he wasn't even able to speak. They had microphones like these that we're speaking into. And he desired to, to say some words. He wanted to say something to us. He was straining to say something to us. But ultimately, he just sat back in his chair and resigned that he wasn't going to be able to say anything. But those actions and that beautiful witness that he bore in his own life to suffering spoke volumes to us and that was an image of christ because he followed after that it is only through the cross that we are able to come to the glory of the resurrection and that's why we have to somehow measure up to that in our own understanding and in our own lives and it is in fact because of sin sin is known to god and to all of creation that was a magnificent word. I, I had never heard it put in that way, but but in, in Sheen's capacity to teach, he said in that way, sins committed in the country that made all nature blush. That's the way it is. There's nothing that will be hidden. And that's why we have to be conscious of our own sins and conscious that the reality of sins is known and will be known like in the fullness of the light of day like in the fullness of the noonday sun and so we thank the lord for these revelations for these epiphanies and i encourage you to to be able to recognize the truth and to try to stand up and to and to present yourself before truth and in humility to be able to conform your life to Christ. Mm, Jedi Knight, Father Henry Clay Hunt III. Thank you for that. Woo! Jorge, last but not least, please. We are approaching Christmas. And, and while, while the listening audience may be hearing it at a different time, we here in the studio are recording this right before, the ad, uh, uh, before Christmas. And, and yet we're speaking about the crucifixion, and we're speaking about the, the, the death. And how do they tie together? Well, I, 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 I too found that idea of the gardens as Sheen brings those two concepts together, the Garden of, Get, uh, of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane. And I, and I think about when, when Eve reached for that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that action of her will being pushed in, uh, in, in pulling that fruit down. 
And then I, and then I fast forward in, in human history and, and know, while well, Scripture doesn't reference this point, but mystics have spoken about it, that when Jesus was born, that that, that, that moment that Jesus is born, that it is here that Mary is offering Jesus back up. It is like she is putting him back on the tree, the fruit, as it were, back on the tree, restoring humanity. That, that great gift of what Mary is doing. You say, well, how did she know that? Well, the angel had told her. She knew that who she was bearing would be the Messiah. And she knew that the Messiah would die. And he would die for the, for, for, for the sins of all humanity, would die from the, for the sins of Adam and Eve. And, would, and, and here she is in full knowledge to knowing that this gift that she was receiving, that she was giving back. And so I think about how the Lord looks to us and how we can authenticate our conversion experience as all these uh, members have spoken today about the redemptive value of suffering and how Thomas was able to authenticate Jesus through the wounds, through the wounds. He knew that Jesus was who he was because he was wounded for all humanity. And we think, why was Jesus wounded? And why did he fix himself completely but not his hands? Would it not be so that you and I, in our own suffering, could identify with Jesus? Jesus who is on the cross? Jesus who is, who is there in front of the Father, who is speaking on our behalf? Father, forgive them for they don't understand. So I think of the great honor that we've had to, to study under the, the, the Master Jedi Knight, as, as uh, uh, Father Clay speaks about Fulton Sheen. And I, and, I, and I just thank God that we have this opportunity to share this message with you for Christmas. Wonderful words. You know, I love listening because I'm auditory. I do radio and I hear Father Will, mm, mm. <laughs> but when he looks down and writes after something you said, it's got to be good. Thank you for that, Father, uh, Father Will, for doing that and Jorge for sharing that. Um, and as we, all, we close every Fulton Sheen prayer group, Jorge, would you lead us in the litany of closing prayer? Yes, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Jesus, we thank you for today that you have given us this opportunity to come together and understand the dynamics of the cross, your cross, and the cross that you ask us to bear with you, that you bear with us. So those of us that have special prayer petitions, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of supplication, prayers of petition, let's lift them up at this time. The Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane to the Garden by Calvary, that we indeed may may die and start anew from the virgin womb to the virgin tomb. We pray that we uh, may not be afraid to love, even to the tree of life, to the, to the cross, that we may die to self-will and, and rise in your divine will and truly love as you are love. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. And I also pray that anyone who's listening that is, mm -hmm. that is actively suffering, uh, suffering either mentally or physically, or in, in ones that love that are suffering, I ask that you perse persevere and remember that that mm -hmm. suffering has salvific uh, importance, and I ask you to turn to Jesus yes. and lay it up uh, at the foot of the cross. We ask this. Uh, uh, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Ad adult children who might be um, in some proximity to their, their parents, or their loved one who might have raised them, that they, before they pass, <clears throat> this, um, that they will have an opportunity to, uh, to make amends, to go and, and uh, ask for forgiveness, or in, in their own words, to forgive, mm -hmm. and uh, to, bring, to bring healing and wholeness to the, to the absence of that individual, especially those who might be in hospitals or, or um, in any situation, it um, doesn't matter if they're sick or not, because our life can be, uh, can be cut short if, without our knowledge. But um, that's my prayer, that, that uh, children will make amends with their parents before their parents' passing. Mm -hmm. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayers. prayers. We, uh, before our next uh, session, uh, my family and I will be embarking on seeing some specialists for my daughter, and I ask mm -hmm. for all that oh, yeah. that's uh, the trip the stay, the visits, the doctors, that it all go, go well according yes. to his plan. For this we pray yes. to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. 
We pray for the soul of Chris Schott. She was a beautiful woman of faith. And may she be given the gift of eternal glory for the Holy Christmas. And we pray in a special way for all the men and the women who are incarcerated. May Christ be the one to live their heart. And may he himself be the joy that sustains them. We pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our, our prayers. prayers. Heavenly Father, we lift up these prayer petitions, those spoken and those in the recesses of our heart. We lift them up to you, Heavenly Father, with the prayer your Son Jesus gave us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, o Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with, with your spirit. spirit. And through the intercession of the holy man to God, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And that ends our program for today. God love you. Today in Lesson 14, Suffering, Death, Resurrection, By His Wounds We Are Healed, Sheen discussed Christ became a sin-bearer through a sinless obedience, and the wounds of our risen Lord were important to our salvation. Next week in Lesson 15, Ascension, Beyond the Space Age, Sheen will be discussing, is Christ's incarnation linked to His Ascension? Did Christ ascend to heaven with His human nature intact with His divine nature? Don't miss next week's show when Fulton Sheen takes us deeper into the understanding that life is worth living. God love you. Beloved family, I want to challenge you to gather together in small groups. This is what the church needs. The church began in the house of Nazareth, and then it grew in the upper room, and they continue to meet in homes as well as in the temple. It is so important we gather together in the name of Jesus. And that's what's so great about this venerable Fulton Sheehan uh, face-sharing group is to gather together to call on the Holy Spirit, a litany of humility, a humble heart so you can listen and learn. God speaking through this wonderful servant. These 20-minute talks, there are a total of 50 of them, philosophy of life. And by gathering together a total of 50 times and sharing the faith together and sharing your own personal journey together and praying together, the Holy Spirit, there's Jesus in your midst. And it's a powerful way to be transformed so you can transform the city and the world. It only takes 10 people to save a city. And you might be one of them. How is God calling you to gather together a small group and hear and live the good news? Please join us again for another lesson from Archbishop Fulton Sheen. You can also listen to lessons and read transcripts at your leisure by visiting the website, theuniversalway.com. That's theuniversalway.com. God love you.